Welcome to this short series of tutorials designed to present a simplified look at multiple image compositing in Photoshop CC so that you can quickly get started combining your own photos into new image creations. Making composites from different photos is one of my favorite things to do in Photoshop because there are so many ways that I can create interesting designs and intriguing imaginary scenes. In this tutorial, we'll start with the first part of the compositing process and take a look at a couple of ways that you can combine different photos into a single file. This aerial shot of a vineyard will serve as the background scene for my composite. I want to add some additional photos into this file to create an image that could be used for promotional or editorial purposes. I'll add the first photo using a simple drag and drop method. This is very easy and it works with both the Mac Finder and the Windows File Explorer. To do this, go out to your system and locate the file you want to add and simply drag and drop it onto the open Photoshop file. The image will appear with a transform bounding box around it as you can see here. At this stage, you can click and drag on any of the small square handles to resize the photo. The scaling will always be proportional and will not affect the original aspect ratio of the photo. If you wanted to change the proportions of the photo as you scale it smaller, hold down the shift key while you click and drag on one of the square handles. I'll choose Command Z on a Mac or Control Z on Windows to undo that last move. For this image, I want to scale it smaller to about 40% of its original size. You can see that value reflected up in the width and height fields of the options bar. That looks pretty good. So to apply this, I can click the check mark button in the options bar, or you can also just press enter on the keyboard. In Photoshop CC 2019, you can also apply a transformation simply by clicking in the main document window outside the transform boundary box. I'll click the check mark in the options bar. I'll get the move tool and let's just adjust this right about there. Now, if we look down at the layers panel, you can see that the photo has been added as a new layer. This little icon in the corner of the layer thumbnail indicates that this is a smart object. Smart objects are a special kind of layer that allow you to apply transformations, such as scaling a photo smaller, so that the change is non-destructive. In a normal layer, when you resize something to be smaller, Photoshop will discard the pixels on that layer to fulfill your resizing request. If you have scaled the layer to be a lot smaller than the original, this could result in a loss of image quality if later on you decide that you want to return the layer back to its original size. With a smart object, however, all of the original image information is embedded inside the smart object, and you can always return it back to its original size with no loss in quality. So for example, if I go up to the Edit menu and choose Transform Scale, you can see the size that I scaled it to still entered into the width and height fields in the options bar. And I can grab one of these handles and scale the image back up to its original size, and it still looks great. I'll just press the Escape key to cancel that operation. And now let's explore another way that you can add an image to a composite that will also result in a smart object. To do this, go up to the File menu and choose Place Embedded. Navigate out to the image that you want to add, select it, and click Place in the lower right corner. As with the first image that I added, you can see the bounding box that will allow you to transform the image smaller. In this case, I'm going to scale it down to about 40% of its original size. Now, if you know the exact scale percentage, you can enter it here into either the width or the height field. So this was 40.12. And notice that as I type that, the height is set to the same value. That's because this link icon is turned on here, which tells Photoshop to maintain the aspect ratio between the width and the height. I'll press Enter to apply that value, and then I can press Enter again, or click the check mark icon in the options bar to apply the transformation. And let's just move this into position right there. There are other ways that you can add photos into an open file in Photoshop. The main advantage of the method shown in this tutorial is that they both result in the creation of a smart object layer. This allows for open-ended flexibility for transforming the new image element, which can be very useful when making multiple image composites. One of the most effective ways to combine images in Photoshop CC is to use a layer mask to determine which parts of a layer will be visible in the composite. In this tutorial, we'll explore how you can create a layer mask using the brush tool and also from a selection of a specific area. 
I'm going to start off by adding a layer mask to the door layer in this image. I'll do that by coming down to the bottom of the layers panel and clicking on the add layer mask button. Next I'll come over to the tools panel and I'll make the brush tool active. Down at the bottom of the tools panel I want to make sure that black is in my foreground color swatch here. If black is in the background swatch as is the case here you can easily exchange these colors just by tapping X on the keyboard. Next I want to increase the size of my brush. I'll do that with a really useful shortcut by tapping repeatedly on the right bracket key to make the brush bigger. If you tap several times on the left bracket key it'll make the brush smaller. Now before I begin painting I want to make sure that I'm going to be painting on the layer mask and not on the actual photo layer. So over here in the layers panel I'm going to make sure that there's a highlight border around the thumbnail of the layer mask. That indicates that it's active. When in doubt you can just click on the mask to make sure it's active. Now I'll come back over to the image and I will paint over the doorway to reveal the image of the woman walking along the forest path that's on the underlying layer. And that looks really cool. If you look at the thumbnail of the layer mask you can see that the black areas correspond to where I just painted with the brush. Now if you accidentally paint too much on the mask and hide too much of the layer you can always bring it back by painting with white on the layer mask. So I'm going to tap X on my keyboard which will place white in the foreground swatch over here and now I can paint with white on the layer mask and bring back that layer that I accidentally hid with the brush stroke a moment ago. Now this is a really important concept when you're working with layer masks in Photoshop. White reveals the layer and black conceals it, allowing you to see through to the layer underneath. Let's try out a more precise way of applying a layer mask to the door using a selection. I'm going to drag the thumbnail of the layer mask down to the trash can at the bottom of the layers panel and I'll click delete. Next I'll go over to the tool panel and I'll make the quick selection tool active. I'm going to begin my selection by clicking and dragging over the archway that surrounds the door. Now the nice thing about the quick selection tool is that once you click and start dragging the selection it automatically switches into the add to mode. So you can just continue dragging over the areas that you want to add into the selection. All right that looks pretty good. I'll come back to the layers panel and I'll come down and click that add layer mask button again. This creates a layer mask that is based on that selection. Now if you look at the tones in the layer mask you can see that the white areas correspond to what was selected and the black areas represent the areas that were not selected. So far this composite is looking pretty good but I want to refine it using the brush tool. So I'll make sure that the layer mask is active. I'll come over and get that brush tool I'm going to tap the left bracket key a couple times to make my brush smaller. And finally, I'll tap X on the keyboard to place black in the foreground swatch. And I'm just going to brush a little bit along the bottom edge of the doorway here to make it look as if these leaves are kind of piled up and it's a little bit more wild and untidy looking. There we go. So one more thing is I'm going to come up to the options bar for the brush tool and change my opacity down to about 45 or 50 percent. And I'm going to brush over the layer mask and that's going to partially reveal the forest and partially conceal the door. And you can see that represented in the gray tones in the layer mask right here. Layer masks are one of the most essential techniques that you have in your Photoshop compositing toolkit. Because they mask parts of an image instead of actually erasing detail, they're very flexible and they allow you precise control over which parts of a layer are visible in your composite image. For compositing projects in Photoshop CC that require a gradual and seamless blend, one of the best tools to use with a layer mask is the gradient tool. In this tutorial, we'll explore some of the ways that you can use a gradient mask to create smooth transitions from one image to another. In this wedding composite, I have a nice close-up view of the couple embracing with the bride looking into the camera, as well as a long shot of the couple on the beach. My goal with this is to create a smooth and seamless transition between the two photos. I'll click on the top layer to make it active and then down at the bottom of the layers panel I'll click on the add layer mask button. The layer mask that's added is totally white which means it's currently showing all of the top layer. To create the smooth transition I'll come over to the tool panel 
and I'll choose the gradient tool. Up in the options bar for this tool, I'll click on the first gradient style icon, which is for a linear gradient. Next, I'll come over and I'll make sure that the blending mode for the gradient is set to normal and the opacity is at 100%. I also want to make sure that this button, which controls reversing the gradient colors, is unchecked. Next, I'll come over to the gradient picker and click on it to open it up. The first two gradient swatches are always based on the foreground to background color or foreground to transparency, so their appearance may change depending on what those colors are set to. The third gradient swatch is always black to white, and that's what I'm going to click on here. In a layer mask, black hides what's on the layer and white shows the layer, so this will create a smooth transition from parts of the layer being hidden to being totally visible. I'll press the Enter key on the keyboard to close the gradient picker. Next, I'll double check to make sure that the layer mask is indeed the active part of this layer, and the highlight border around the mask thumbnail confirms this. My goal with this mask is to totally hide the hard edge of the photo on the right side here, and then gradually reveal the photo to create a seamless blend between the two images. With a gradient, where you start dragging the line will be the beginning color, which in this case is black, and where you end the line will be the end color, which is white. So I'm just going to click just to the left of this hard edge here and drag to the left to about where the woman's earring is. And that creates a really wonderful blending effect between the two photos. If you're not satisfied with the way the gradient looks, simply drag out a new one and it'll replace what was there before. You can also try dragging out diagonal gradients to see how that looks. For this image, it doesn't work too well, but for some projects, it might. Now, when you drag out a really short gradient line, it creates a more abrupt and noticeable blend. If you drag out a longer gradient line, it creates a more gradual, smooth, and seamless transition. Now, for this photograph, this gradient is working really well, but let's try a different type of gradient. I'll come up to the options bar for the tool, and I'll click on that second icon, which is a radial gradient. Then I'll place my cursor right where their faces are meeting and drag down diagonally to the woman's elbow. So that's not working the way I wanted because I'm still set to a black to white gradient up here in the gradient picker. And the black, which is the starting color, is hiding their faces. You can see that here in the thumbnail of the layer mask. All I have to do to fix that is come up to the options bar and click on this button to reverse the gradient colors. Now if I do that same drag again, from their faces down to her elbow, it creates a much better blend. There's still a little bit of the hard edge showing here, but if I come over and get the brush tool, I can use a large soft edge brush and paint with black to hide that. There we go. Next, I'm gonna tap X on the keyboard, which will place white down in my foreground color swatch, and I'm gonna press two on the keyboard to set my brush opacity to 20%, and I'm just gonna brush in a little bit more of her arm and elbow showing up there. There we go, that looks really nice. The gradient tool is definitely one of the most effective tools in Photoshop CC for many different photo and design scenarios. Using it with a layer mask is an essential technique for creating a smooth and seamless transition in multiple image composites. One of the cool things about using Photoshop CC to create multiple image composites is that there are so many interesting ways that you can blend photos together. For some types of composites, you may not even need to make selections or create precise layer masks, but instead you can combine images using layer blend modes. In this tutorial, we'll take a look at some essential concepts for understanding how certain blend modes can work for compositing projects. Let's begin with a quick look at the terrain that we're going to be exploring in this example, much like the explorer in this photograph is surveying the mountain landscape before them. In addition to the night view of the mountain scene, I also have a layer with a reflected purple mesh of connected points on a black background. And for the top layer, I have a copy of the mesh image that I have inverted and made black and white. Now this may seem somewhat random, but there's a definite methodology to this example. In order to demonstrate how you can think about how some blend modes work, I wanted a layer with light subject matter on a black background as well as dark subject matter on a white background. Let's start exploring. I'm gonna begin with the darker mesh on the white background. 
So I'll turn off the visibility for the purple mesh layer just to take it out of the equation. I'll make that top layer active and I will click to open the blend mode menu at the top of the layers panel. Now in Photoshop CC 2019, you can just mouse over the different blend modes in the menu and it will instantly preview the effect in your main image, which makes it really useful to explore the blend modes and see what they do and how they will affect your photographs. But there are some important concepts to understand that will help you use them more effectively. The first thing to notice is that the blend modes are divided into specific groups. This is important because two of the groups up near the top of the menu, the ones with darken and lighten as the first blend modes in the group, will give you a clue as to how they'll affect the image. The darkened blend modes compare the color and tonal values of the active layer with the underlying layers and will emphasize whatever is darker on each layer. These blend modes also do not show anything that is white. So for instance, with the multiply blend mode that I've chosen here, you can see that the white areas on this layer are not visible at all, but the darker areas of the mesh are. In some areas of the scene, such as the rock outcropping on the left, we can't see the mesh pattern because those areas of the rock are darker than the mesh of connected points. The darkened blend modes are very useful anytime you have dark subject matter on a light background that you want to easily blend into a photo, such as blending the text of old letters or documents into an image. The lightened blend modes will compare the tonal and color values on the active layer with the underlying layers and will emphasize whatever is lighter on each layer. Now for this mesh layer that already has a white background, it is overwhelming the mountain scene below because of course it is much lighter than the mountain scene. So that's not really working. I'm going to turn that layer off and I'm going to go to the purple mesh layer with the black background and now I'll set that to lighten and now we're getting somewhere. That actually looks pretty cool. So this is lighten, here is screen, color dodge, linear dodge add. An important thing to know about the light and blend modes is that they do not show anything that is black. So all of the black areas on this layer are not visible in the composite when one of the light and blend modes are used. The light and blend modes are very useful anytime that you have light subject matter on a dark background that you want to easily blend into a photo, such as bright lighting effects like stars or lens flares, or light leaks from old film images. So in this quick look at blend modes, I focused on how you can take advantage of the darken and lighten blend modes for compositing purposes. There are many other layer blend modes to explore, 26 in all. Take them for a spin with some of your own images. Once you understand some of the key concepts that govern how they work, you'll know what the general effect will be, allowing you to use them more effectively to combine images. One of the final touches in any compositing project is to create a unified look and feel so that the color and tonal qualities will match among the different image elements. In this tutorial, we'll explore some ways to create a unifying color treatment for a composite in Photoshop CC. For this project, we have a science fiction composite, and I want to try out an overall cool and blue look for the entire scene. First, I'm going to create a layer with the average color of the blue background. This can sometimes be an effective way to create a unifying color treatment based on colors that are present in a single layer. I'm going to turn off the visibility of the robot and astronaut group by clicking on its eye icon, and I'll just click on this triangle here to close the group. My background layer is active, so I'll come up to the layer menu and choose New, Layer via Copy. Command J or Control J is the very useful shortcut for that. Next, I'll click on the Desert City layer in the Layers panel, and I'll drag that down underneath the new copy layer. I'll click on that background copy layer to make it active, and I'll come up to the Filter menu and choose Blur Average. So this takes all the colors on that layer, and it averages them into a single color. To blend this in, I'll open up the Blend Mode menu at the top of the Layers panel, come down to almost the bottom, and I'll choose Color. So that looks good, but the tint is a single color, and few things in life, even on other planets, are a single color. So I'm going to come up and lower the opacity for that layer to about 55%. I think that looks pretty good. 
The other thing I'm noticing if I turn this layer off and then on again is that I'm losing some of this nice rich blue saturation in that motion blur. So I can fix that by coming up to the layer menu and choosing create clipping mask. Now what this will do is it will clip or attach this active layer to the layer immediately underneath so that whatever this layer does, it's only affecting this underlying layer and not the other layers under that. So that looks good. Let's move on to the robot and the astronaut. I'm going to click on their eye icon to make them visible and then click on the group name to make it active. I'm going to come over to the eyedropper tool and I'm going to select and sample the color right next to the robot's eye. Now what I want to do with this sampled color is I want to turn it into a color fill layer, but I also want to use the same layer clipping mask technique that I used on that color average layer a moment ago. I can do this with a really useful shortcut. I'm going to hold down the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on Windows, and I will come and click on the Create New Fill or Adjustment Layer button down here at the bottom of the Layers panel. I'm going to choose Solid Color, and that Option or Alt key shortcut is what prompts this dialog to pop up where we find this very useful checkbox to use previous layer to create a clipping mask. I'll choose that and click OK, and then I'll click OK in the color picker. And you can see that this new color fill layer is indeed only affecting the robot and the astronaut. Let's open up the layer blend mode menu in the layers panel and we'll come down and I can choose either hue or color. Each of these has a different effect. The color mode is a lot more pronounced and affects more of the image. Hue on the other hand is more subtle and will not tint areas where there was little or no color saturation to begin with, such as the light areas on the astronaut and the robot. For this scene, I like hue, so I'm going to choose that. Next, I'm going to edit this layer mask for this fill layer. So I'll click on it to make it active. I'm going to come and get the brush tool. Down at the bottom of the tool panel, I see that black is my foreground color. So I'm just going to start painting on that layer mask to bring in the red light and the glow of the light on the front of the astronaut suit and also on the eye of the robot. And finally, I'm going to lower the opacity of my brush down to about 60% and I'll paint on the astronaut's face just to bring in some nice color so she looks a little bit more healthy there inside of her suit. So you can see that creating a color treatment for a composite project can really tie everything together so that it works as a unified image. It's a final dash of image seasoning that is an essential part of creating successful composites from multiple photos.